It's time for a Karn the Living Legacy deck that warps time itself. Using charge counters and artifacts, I'm going to win the day, and I hope you stay tuned. Hello, planeswalkers of the internet, oathbreakers, and all of you other Magic the Gathering fans out there. Today, I'm bringing you a Karn the Living Legacy deck that uses a Magistrate's staff to go infinite in turns and has a lot of shenanigans. Karn the Living Legacy is our Oathbreaker, of course. He costs four colorless mana and has four loyalty. If we plus one him, he'll make us a Power Stone. If we minus one him, we can pay any amount of mana. Look at that many cards from top of our deck. Choose one to put back on top and put the rest on the bottom in a random order. I'm sorry, that one goes into your hand. If we minus seven him, we get an emblem that says we can tap artifacts to do damage, which is amazing and a win condition for the deck. Our signature spell is Introduction to Prophecy. I'm not super happy with this choice. We only have so many signature spells in Colorless that we can run. And I didn't want to put all this dust in the command zone because that will often trigger opponents to focus on you force at first because you've got the biggest threat in the command zone. This will help us dig into our deck a little bit uh, more and that will help with our game plan, however. So that's why I went with it. Cobwork Assembler costs three colorless mana and is a 2-3. If we pay seven, we can create a token as a copy of target artifact. That token gains haste, exile at the beginning of the next end step. The reason this card made this deck is that this is actually based on a modern combo deck. And in the modern combo deck, I can obviously run four of each card I need. In Oathbreaker, I can't because it's singleton. So I needed to play something to kind of make up the difference. Core Tapper is great for two mana. We can tap him to put a charge counter on target artifact, or we can sacrifice him to put two charge counters on target artifact. I think we have to have three charge counters on Magistrate Scepter to tap it to take an extra turn, and we remove those counters. So this is a great way to just make sure we're putting counters on it every turn. And next we have Phyrexian Revoker. This is a common hate piece in Oathbreaker. It's a 2-1 for 2. When enters the battlefield, we choose a non-land card name and activated abilities of a source with the chosen name can't be activated. I would say if you're going to play Phyrexian Revoker at a competitive table, it's fine to use it to target someone's dangerous or deadly planeswalker you don't want to deal with. Other than that, I'd probably choose it to target some other card with an effect you don't want to necessarily rush out Revoker. You can use it to deal with a problem after your opponent plays it. So just pay attention to the active abilities on your opponent's cards. Vulcan Voltatic Servant says at the beginning of our end step, we can untap target artifact. That's important. Say we want to untap Core Tapper and retap it to put an additional charge counter on our Magistrate Scepter that will allow us to maybe get the three charge counters in the same turn, take an extra turn. It's little things like that that allow this deck to go infinite. All is Dust is a just the best board wipe for our deck because it's going to cause each player to sacrifice all permanents they control that have a uh, colored identity that are colored. We don't have any colored permanents, so it doesn't hit us at all, and getting to seven mana isn't impossible. Getting to nine mana is a little bit harder, but like I said, our Planeswalker makes us mana rocks we can tap so we can often make up the difference oh never mind this isn't my signature spell if you want to run this as a signature spell those are things to think about arcane spyglass costs four we can pay two and tap it sacrifice a land and draw a card and put a charge counter on arcane spyglass if we remove three charge counters from it we draw a card a lot of the stuff we have has charge counters on them because we have a way to move them around I'm probably not going to use the Sacrifice of Land to draw a card, but it is nice draw in a tight situation, especially if you're just looking for your win condition or a particular piece. Astral Cornucopia costs XXX. It enters the battlefield with X charge counters on it. We can tap and choose a color, and we add one mana for each charge counter of the chosen color. So... One of the things to do in this deck is to put one charge counter on it. Play it as a three mana rock on turn three. That is totally fine. You can do that. And then use a core tapper and proliferate and other things to keep increasing the number of charge counters on it. 
and you can end up with an absurd amount of mana coming from Astral Cornucopia and from one of the other mana rocks in the deck. Clock of Omen allows us to tap two and tap artifacts we control to untap target artifact. Again, this is in here to get multiple uses out of cards like Core Tapper in a turn. Coalition Relic can tap for one mana of any color, or we can tap and put a charge counter at it. At the beginning of our pre-combat main phase, we remove all the charge counters from it and add one mana for each charge counter removed this way. So we have ways to proliferate in the deck, getting a first charge counter on there so we can proliferate it up and then remove all the charge counters uh, can generate us quite a bit of good mana, you know. Everflowing Chalice is the other mana rock I was talking about. You're going to want to multi-kick it for one, so there's a counter on it when it enters play, probably. And then once it enters play, you can start proliferating it up, and it'll make more and more mana. If you already have a crazy amount of mana, there's no reason not to kick this multiple times. I'm just talking about the best way to play it if you don't want to waste resources early game. Expedition Map lets us go get a land card. Gavel of the Righteous is a two-cost... Uh, equipment where we can either pay three mana or we can remove a charge counter from it to equip it. The equipped creature will get plus one plus one for each charge counter on Gavel for the Righteous and at the beginning of combat on our turn we put a counter on it. As long as it has four more counters on it the equipped creature also has double strike. So once this has four counters on it it gives the creature plus four plus four and double strike which means that creature is actually swinging for eight damage. Isn't that amazing? I don't know why this cards are only 35 cents. I think it just probably got missed during New Capenna, but it's actually a really good equipment, especially if you're playing with a lot of proliferate in your deck. Uh, Glistening Sphere is a mana rock that taps one mana of any color. When it enters the battlefield, we proliferate. Uh, it's got a corrupted ability, but we don't have poison counters in this deck. We could. If you wanted to run any of the artifact creatures that give your opponents poison counters or have infect, you could totally do that and work towards that goal as well, at which point your extra proliferate stuff will work towards uh, a win condition. I didn't go that route. I felt like infinite turns was already too much. Golden Urn, at the beginning of our upkeep, we may put a charge counter on it. We can tap and sacrifice the game life equal to the number of charge counters on it. A couple of these cards that just get a free charge counter every turn are just good for what we're trying to do. Also, gaining a bunch of life back in Oathbreaker once you're low can actually get you right back into the game. Golden Foundry, and then we recast a uh, artifact spell, we can put a charge counter on it. We can remove three charge counters on it to make a 3-3 three, three golem. So we can make a small army. It's also going to get charge counters relatively quickly and often, like very often. So it's a good card. Grind Clock, we can tap to put a charge counter on it. We can also tap it to uh, have target player mill X cards where X is the number of counters on it. Again, just another win condition for the deck. Heart of Kirin lets us remove loyalty counters from our Planeswalker to crew it. It is a 4-4 Flying Vigilance Crew 3 creature. I kind of include it because flying creatures are pretty good at striking at other opponents' Planeswalkers by going over the, their army in a lot of games. Lux Cannon, we can tap to put a charge counter on it, or we can tap it and remove three charge counters to destroy target permanent. This is a big piece of removal for us in the deck, especially since there might be times where we can use it more than once in a turn, given our untap and tap shenanigans. Magistrate Scepter, here's the card I've been talking about for three mana. It is a three cost artifact. We can tap for and tap it to put a counter on it. We can tap and remove three counters from it to take an extra turn after this one. So if we can get the first counter on it by paying four and then proliferate it up each turn, that's fine. But we always need somewhere to start with if we're proliferating, if that makes any sense. But if we're using Core Tapper and tapping and untapping Core Tapper to get the three counters onto it, then we can just tap it to take an extra turn. So this can help us go infinite in this particular deck. There's quite a bit of math involved as far as all the token uh, counters go. Manifold key costs one. We can pay one and tap it, untap another artifact, or we can pay three and tap to make a creature unblockable. Mirage Mirror, we can pay two. It becomes a copy of target artifact, creature, enchantment, or land until our next turn. A lot of things to copy. You know, it also says uh, target 
one of those things that doesn't say that we control. So if our opponents play some strong stuff, we have an in to get access to it. Moon Silver Key costs two. We can pay one, uh, tap and sacrifice it, search your library for an artifact card with a mana ability or a basic land card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle. This will get us like most of our artifacts that are mana rocks, you know, and it'll get us basic lands. So it's half ramp, half tutor. Mystical Forge lets us look at the top card of our library at any time. We can cast artifact spells from the top of our library. We can tap and pay one life and exile the top card of our library. So this does for us is it's a massive draw engine for the deck. So it's available and colorless to us. It allows us to actually uh, play multiple spells in a turn. And if we do hit a dead card on the top of our library, it allows us to get rid of it at least once. I would say if you're running Anything that will reshuffle your uh, library, like Terramorphic Expanse or Evolving Wilds, this works really well with those. Paradox Engine, whenever you cast a spell, untap all non-land permanents you control. That's just a great card, and it's not banned in Oathbreaker. Pithing Needle, it does exactly what a Phyrexian Revoker does. When it comes into play, we choose a card name. Activated abilities of the chosen name can't be activated unless the mana abilities, so... Power Conduit, we can tap it to remove uh, a counter from a permanent we control, and then we can put a charge counter on an artifact or a 1-1 one -one counter on a creature, our choice. So a lot of that stuff that just generates free charge counters every single turn is in here because Power Conduit's in here, so that we always have something to remove to move those counters around. Ratchet Bomb is Ratchet Bomb. Ratchet Bomb, you tap it, put charge counters on it, tap sacrifice it, it's good to destroy each permanent with a mana value equal to the charge counters. You play Ratchet Bomb on two and sack it for zero to destroy all token creatures is a really good use for, but also you can pretty much use it to target any permanent. If you know somebody's deck is really built around the three costs permanents, it's really good. It's a good card. Reckoner Bank Buster is a 4-4, enters the battlefield with three charge counters on it. We can tap it, uh, pay two, tap it, and remove a charge counter from it and draw a card. If there are no charge counters on it, we can create a treasure token and a 1-1 pirate pilot creature. So, we can put counters on them just to remove them. So once we get down to zero, we can make sure we just put one on, take one off, get the treasure token and the creature every time we tap it. This is basically we're paying one and tapping it to get a creature and a one one uh, a treasure and a one one pilot and using the treasure. It, you know, it's wonderful. Sculpting steel can become a target of any other artifact on the battlefield, which is nice. Brian and piercing visions cost two uh, at the beginning of our upkeep or whenever we cast a blue spell, we put a charge counter on it. We tap and sacrifice it. We can look at the top X cards of our library um, where X is the number of charge counters put one of those cards into our hand and the rest on the bottom of our library. This is just another tutor. It does what Karn's middle ability does, but because we don't have to spend mana to do it, it's a little bit better. Uh, Skyship Weatherlight. When it enters the battlefield, we search our library for any number of artifacts or creature cards and exile them and shuffle, which is great. So this will get us all and everything we want to tutor for. If we pay for and tap it, we choose a card that's randomly exiled with it and we get to put it into its owner's hand. So this allows us to pull stuff directly from our graveyard into our hand. I usually only use it to get Magister's Staff, but you do have options. Sphere of the Suns, uh, you tap it, remove a charge counter and add one man of any color and a display with three charge counters on it works really well in this deck. Staff of Completion costs three. You can tap it and pay life to do different effects. The first one is pay one life, destroy target permanent, you own. Pay two life, add one man of any color. Pay three life, proliferate. Pay four life, draw a card. Pay five, untap it. Uh, the proliferate on that for three life should not be undercut. In this deck, it is amazing. It fills your board, gets you to a point where you can alter your commander, gets you to a point where you can actually emblem out. So really good card. Strixhaven Stadium costs three. We can tap to add one mana of any color and we put a point counter on it. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to us, we remove a point. Whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to an opponent, we put a point counter on it. If it has 10 or more point counters on it, we move them all and that player loses the game. So 
This is great because we don't actually sacrifice it, so we can play multiple games against multiple opponents, and since we can proliferate the counters on it, we can actually make use of this mana rock a little bit better than other decks. Sun Droplet, whenever you're dealt damage, you put that many charge counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may move one counter to gain one life. Surge Node enters the battlefield with six charge counters on it. We can pay one and tap it to remove a charge counter on it to put a charge counter on another artifact. Throne of Geth, we can tap, sacrifice an artifact, and then proliferate. This works exceptionally well with those treasure tokens we create from Reckoner Bank Buster, so that's something to keep in mind. We have Unwinding Clock, untap all artifacts we control during each other player's untap step. Vexing Puzzle Box. Whenever we would roll one or more dice, we put a charge counter on Vexing Puzzle Box equal to the result. We can tap it and add one mana of any color to our mana pool, and then we roll a d20. We tap it and remove 100 charge counters from it. We can search our library for an artifact card and put that card onto the battlefield and then shuffle. That might not seem as doable as you might think, but when you're untapping your artifacts every time you play an artifact or during each other player's uh, untap step, you can actually get to 100 charge counters more frequently than you would think. So it's a mana rock and a tutor. Voltatic Key, we can pay one and tap it to untap an artifact. Blast Zone, we can put X and X and tap it to put charge counters into it. If we pay three, tap and sacrifice it, we can destroy each non-land permanent with mana value equal to the charge counters on Blast Zone. Blast Zone is essentially just, uh, you know, a ratchet bomb, but different. So it's hidden in our mana base. It's a good place for it. Gemstone Caverns, um, if it's in your opening hand and you're not the starting player, you may begin the game with Gemstone Caverns on the battlefield with a luck counter on it. If you do, you exile a card from your hand. Uh, you can tap it to add colorless. If it has a luck counter on it, you can tap it for one mana of any color. This is such an edge case, I'll probably remove this card. This card is a $54 card. There's only one in the deck. We're probably not going to have it in our opening hand most of the time. I just, the fact it's a land that has a counter is part of why it made the deck. Inventor's Fair, at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control three artifacts, we gain a life. We can tap it for colorless. We can pay for and tap it and sack it to search our library for an artifact card, reveal it, put it into our hand, and then shuffle. Uh, we do need to have three artifacts in play to do that, but it's just basically another tutor. Karn's Bastion, we can pay for and tap it to proliferate. Nesting Grounds, we can pay one and tap it to move a counter from target permanent we control to another target permanent we control. Tendo Ice Bridge enters play with an ice counter. We can tap it for colorless or tap it and remove the charge counter from it to add one man of any color. Monosynth Gardens, we can tap it for colorless, pay one and tap it to add a one man of any color, or we can pay X and tap it and becomes a copy of target non-token artifact we control with mana value X. Again, like I said, in the original deck, we can run four ofs. In this deck, we need copies of things. Urza Saga is, of course, Urza Saga. It is uh, a land that taps for mana, makes a construct on turn two, and on turn three, we can search our library for an artifact card, mana cost zero or one, and put it onto the battlefield and shuffle. We can also use... I can't think what it's called, not core tap or the other one to remove the lore counters from this to go back a verse. So if we hit verse three before we sack it, we can remove the counter from it, go back to verse two and create our construct. And we can actually do that multiple times. So if you play this late in the game, it's way better. Early in the game, it's probably gonna disappear after three turns. We're running wastes is basic lands. They're expensive basic lands. They haven't been reprinted often or enough. This particular one is $2.99 because it's the secret layer drop version. You can pretty much, if you don't want to run rent waste, but you have a bunch of just bulk lands that have for colorless mana, you can run them instead. Um, that's the deck. Pretty good, pretty solid. I love it. It is a little expensive. This deck, I want to say, runs uh, the $300 price range, which is way more than I usually do for a deck, but I just fell in love with the idea of winning with charge counters they've been around for so long and i've wanted to abuse them forever having said that i hope you guys have a great day like share and subscribe and i hope to see you again next time